Hey, Mike back here again with Canadian Musician. Once again, at the Sheridan Centre Hotel, uh, Canadian Music Week is going on. And it's my real pleasure to have with me Shauna Descartier, uh, founder and president of one of the coolest and most successful indie labels in Canada, Six Shooter Records. Shauna, it's a real pleasure to have you here. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you doing, Mike? Good, good. Uh, can't imagine this is a new experience for you. What, <laughs> what number of CMW would this be for you anyway? Um, well, I guess I started coming to CMW before I even started my mm. record label. So mm. I think the first time I came here was in 1999. Wow. And that's where I saw a showcase with um, it was a Pecan showcase and playing yeah. it was a band named Veal, also yes. the Week Events. And, uh, and I, at that show, I swear, I saw Veal play for the first time, and the, the front man of that band is mm -hmm. Luke Doucette. Yep. And um, so Luke and I started working together from that showcase, wow. and we have been working together ever since. Very cool. Yeah. And of course, uh, Six Shooter has one of the coolest uh, rosters of artists going right now. Uh, Luke Doucette, of course, with Melissa, forms White Horse on the right. record. Tanya Takak, uh, Polaris Prize uh, winner. Um, Amelia Curran, one of my favorite uh, mm -hmm. songwriters in the country. Um, the list goes on and on. Uh, but like you said, it has to start somewhere and with one band. So it was Veal and Luke Doucette that you started off with. Was that uh, just to get into essentially the lead up to your founding of Six Shooter Records, which I believe was 2000, if I remember 2000, correctly. yeah. And uh, so, yeah, how did those initial meetings so I started out as the manager, yeah. and we were shopping the Veal record. Mm -hmm. um, I got a, a deal with Songcorp, a development deal, uh, and I was super green at the time. I didn't really even know. I still don't know what a development deal is. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get it. But anyway, um, that fell through, mm -hmm. and I uh, tried to pitch him to Warner, and there weren't very many independent record labels mm -hmm. around at the time. Uh, and I thought, well, I'm just going to start my own label. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I got a distribution uh, through Outside Music. Cool. And um, then I was at a folk festival one time, uh, right, I guess, uh, in 2000, so just the next year. Yeah. And I was watching um, a workshop that, you know, they have those collaborations. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, Steve Dawson and Oscar Lopez and somebody else that I can't remember. Uh, and I was watching that, and I had one of those shoe-sized cell phones and I phoned Luke on it and I said I'm watching this showcase and I really feel like you should be up there mm -hmm. uh, you play just as well or yeah. better than those guys and he's like yeah yeah I, I really I, I really want to do that and I said maybe you should make a solo record and he said okay yeah yeah I'm gonna do that <laughs> and so that was August and in December he delivered me this solo record okay. <laughs> and uh, that became the very first official Six Shooter release wow. with the um, catalog number 601. Okay. Uh, S I X O one, and uh, that was the beginning of the career and um, the first release. And then um, by that time, I had moved to Toronto, mm -hmm. and um, I met. Uh, so my favorite band of, of life is the Rio Statics. Really. And mm -hmm. I. Um, Who are still on your label, I believe. Well, they're, they're they? about to be on my label, okay. but I, I do manage them. But they've been yeah, on okay. other labels. Um, but I met Martin Tielli mm -hmm. from the Rio Statics in a bar, which I just thought, oh my God, Toronto's the most amazing city in the whole world. Like, I can just go to a random place and meet my musical hero. <laughs> it was incredible. And so uh, we started chatting. And he told me that he had just come out of a writing binge mm -hmm. where he wrote 70 songs wow. in two months, which is a lot of songs that's, to write in two a, months. That's pretty prolific. And I said, wow, that's a lot of songs. And um, <laughs> I don't know if you would be interested, but if I just started a record label and if uh, you were ever wanting to put out a solo record, I would be really keen yeah. to do that with you. And so uh, he went, really? Which I thought was cute because... Here's my hero going. What you put a you put my record out? Yeah. I was like, yes, I would. So that was the second the second yeah. release by Six Shooter, and we've been kind of going since then. In the early 2000s, what kind of infrastructure would you have to have set up to be a record label? Was it like you're a record label because you say you're a record label, or like, uh, well, what, you, what did those you early need stages look like? Yeah. So that was the yeah. main the main thing I needed. Okay. Was uh, to get a distribution deal. Yeah. This is before digital existed, yeah. really, and. Um, so that and, uh, you know, I didn't have any money when I, uh, I left my corporate career, which was going quite well, 
and I took a left field into music and music management. Mm -hmm. And um, my brother said, oh, I don't know why you're doing what you're doing. I don't understand that move, but I, I really believe in you. So here's $15,000. So I had $15,000 to start and um, some credit cards. Yeah. And uh, really it was just credit cards is how I funded my business. And it wasn't really until a number of years later, maybe yeah. 2004 or 2005, that I was able to access factor funding. Yeah. It takes a while to build a track record and yeah. you have to kind of just do things on your own before mm. you can... Show that you're, in a, you're a worthwhile yeah. investment, essentially. Right, yeah. yeah. The, the early 2000s, um, of course, we all know the story of what happened to the music industry as a whole in the early 2000s. Um, you maybe couldn't have picked, like, from the outside, it seems, you maybe couldn't have picked, like, a worse time in the history of right. the music industry to leave a successful corporate career and say, I'm going to start a record label. Yeah. Um, beyond just the passion for music, were you that confident that it could be a viable business, particularly at that point? Well, okay, when I, when I, before I started the label, I quit my corporate job in 1998, and okay. Napster, Napster didn't have it until 1999, <laughs> yeah. so I, I couldn't have had that kind of uh, prescience. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, I was uh, taking, I was working on an MBA at the time, and I was taking this entrepreneurship class, which became, uh, okay, I was 32 years old, I think, something, and, um, it, and taking an MBA, and, and never once had occurred to me that I should go into business for myself. Hmm. So at the first day though, I opened the textbook and I read, here are the attributes of an entrepreneur. And I was like, check, 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 check. And, and I loved the class. And uh, you know, I've always worked really, really hard. And I you know, believe in myself <laughs> and very ambitious. So it that, you know, kind of occurred to me that if I'm gonna work this hard mm -hmm. and put this much of myself into something, yeah. um, that I should, I should, I should do that for myself mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. believe in myself. And also I, ha I had an opportunity to kind of look at the larger picture and examine what my values are, what do I want to get out of my life, yeah. you know, and um, because I would have been very successful in the corporate path mm -hmm. and I probably would have enjoyed that job mm -hmm. uh, fair, to a fair degree, but it wouldn't have meant the same thing yeah. as um, being able to uh, create a house where artists can live and create their body of work and make the world, it bring something to the world that didn't exist before yeah. and have it last long, longer than any of us will be around. Yeah. I think that that's uh, really important to me, the value of what art brings to humanity. Yeah. Oh. Was there an early turning point in Six Shooter's history, whether it was a particular album release or tour or whatever it would have been, where you could, you could identify it as a turning point and see that it was going to, A, the label was going to last, that you had the, you were developing an artist roster that could help it last. Um, essentially, at what point did you know, all right, it's going to be okay, possibly? Um, I don't know if I even know that now. <laughs> Fair enough. So uh, I think, you know, when you run an independent company, uh, it's always kind of on the edge. Yeah. Um, I guess uh, in 2008, okay, so eight, so, years, yeah. <laughs> eight years in, um, we had four releases that year, yeah. and uh, they were uh, Lou Doucette's uh, Blood's Too Rich, uh, Justin Rutledge's, um, um, can't remember the name of that record, uh, Elliot Brew, Mountain Meadows, and NQR Buckle, XOK. And those records were all, all ended up on uh, top 10 lists of, yep. like I couldn't even keep track of all the top 10 mm -hmm. lists, and all of them were on the list, so yeah. seemingly. And um, so that was a, I feel that was a year that put Six Shooter on the map mm -hmm. in, a, in that way. Yeah. Um, it also uh, had the unexpected side effect of kind of pigeonholing me as a Roots uh, Boutique Toronto Roots label. Okay. Which, uh, you know, I love roots music, yeah. but I also love other kinds of music. And so that was um, a little bit tough to break out of. Okay. And it wasn't until we signed uh, Tanya to Gak yep. in uh, 2013 or five years later, I guess, or four, six years later, maybe, um, I think five, uh, where that kind of cleared the deck yes. and brought it back to where I could sign anybody again. Yeah. You know, so, but yeah, so I would say that 2008 was a, a banner year, although, um, you know, we first started. Uh, distributing our records outside of Canada in mm. about 2005. Mm -hmm. We opened a record store in 2006 and got lots of uh, lots of attention from that. Yeah. 
Uh, in 2012, we started producing festivals. We do the yes. Interstellar Rodeo. Uh, so we're going into our seventh year on that. So there's been a number of milestones. I don't know if any of them, one of them is like, oh, now I'm safe. Yeah. I got my first gold yeah. record last year from the Strumbellas. First, first Spirits, yeah. I'm guessing. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah the yeah, album's called album. Hope. Yeah. And Spirits double platinum single. So yeah. that was a big deal for us at yeah, first. Absolutely. And I don't know if we'll ever do that again, but... It was great. Are the Strumbellas one of the bands on your roster that you also manage? No. Oh, okay. No, Joanne Satterington manages them. Okay. Uh, I'm wondering, from the label perspective, um, when you have a big breakout album and single like the Strumbellas experience, um, was it last year or year before when Spirits was pretty much inescapable everywhere yep. around North America? For an indie label like yourself, what ramifications does that have for good or bad? Essentially, how do you manage that success and try to make it sustainable and does it is there a trickle down effect it has on the other artists on the label well i mean i guess from how it, it didn't feel like an overnight thing necessarily mm -hmm. um we had their put their last record out so it's mm -hmm. just constantly building yeah and when i heard the mixes uh from that record yeah. uh a year, like almost a year before it was released, I was like, oh, I knew mm -hmm. what kind of record we had yeah. and was able to kind of adopt things, um, kind of uh, took things out of the schedule mm -hmm. so that my staff could focus on that record, yeah. um, which I knew was going to be a big record. Okay. And um, so I guess in some ways I kind of expected it to be as big as it was because yeah. it, when I heard the, not just spirits, but actually... Uh, there are four or five songs yeah. on that album that could have probably gone the same distance. Yeah. Uh, really, really fantastic writing from Simon Ward. So, um, you know, it did, did give a bit of stability, I mm -hmm. guess, mm -hmm. um, where we had the luxury of ha being able to have our team devote so much time to one project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh does that take a little, how are the other artists on, on an indie label affected when you do have to develop, when you do have to dedicate so much resources to this, um, this breakout album cycle? I don't know, we try not to neglect anyone. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think that probably everybody is happy or they wouldn't still be here. So. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Yeah. And, and sorry to jump around in the timeline here, but just to return back to those fluctuations, to put it kindly, in the music industry throughout the 2000s, was there an advantage to being a new, a new company when that's happening? If you're a legacy label, uh, it's hard to you know, turn the ship on a dime or whatever the saying is, but since you're starting from scratch within this you know, disruptive time. Was there advantages of that because you could essentially just immediately adapt to what you to the new so-called industry? I don't think industry? so. No, I would say no. Um, there's certain certain thing. I mean, one thing that we were so small starting that even though the music industry overall sales were de in decline, our, ours were always on the incline. Oh, yeah. um, but it, it's not that hard to achieve when you're starting at zero. <laughs> uh, but still, we've managed to maintain that trajectory throughout yeah. 18 years. So that's. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, but uh, yes, there, there's a certain uh, mo like nimbleness that you have when you're a small company, and I can just make a decision and change how something is yeah. being done, and not have to consult with a lar large mm -hmm. number of people. But um, you know, those uh, cutting edge technology um, when something something is starting up. The indies are not the where they start. Mm -hmm. When you look at Spotify, for example, yeah. Spotify knew they needed to license or no all Universal. the music. Yeah. And so they cut the three majors yeah. in on an equity basis. Yes. They Which, did not cut the indies in on an yeah. equity basis. And, uh, you no, know. Merlin owns a, owns Mer a Merlin share, is fighting it? hard. Okay. Fighting hard, yeah. And maybe they own a share, I don't know. But it is. Um, we never, we barely even have a seat at the table if we do it all. Yeah. And so now you see Warner divesting their shares. Yeah. Four hundred. Sony has as well. Yeah. Million dollars or whatever, and uh, well, they really benefited, I would say, from that yeah. whole thing. Whereas quite, quite the payday that did, they're getting. Did, yeah. Do the indies uh, or the artists see that benefit? Mm -hmm. 
uh, on the mag like when you look at the IFPI reports over the last few years, all the talks about you know we've now had three straight years of revenue growth in the industry after 15 years of declines, and all the macro level numbers look very positive for the industry as a whole. But is that being experienced at the indie label, or is that? Well, I think that, um, you know, one of the things that's always kind of been the case in, in the uh, music industry is that um, there's a whole lot of artists at the bottom, mm -hmm. there are a few artists at the top, and then there's the middle class. Yeah. And I, I think that partly what's happened with the digitization of the and globalization yeah. of the music sphere is that it has taken away a lot of the ability to earn income from that middle class. Mm -hmm. So if you if you're a say you're a folk artist, well you're not going to get on those playlists that generate those streams yeah. that generate the money. Mm -hmm. So you're probably not necessarily going to attract any more streams than you would if somebody yeah. bought your record and listened to it however many times. Yeah. Um, so, of course, the, the payout mm -hmm. for them and uh, the ability to sell music off stage and yeah. things like that is uh, like we we still put compact discs on our merch tables. Mm -hmm. But who, I, I don't even know. I can play a compact disc in my car still because it's old enough. <laughs> but I can't play one on my computer. I'm one of the few Luddites that still buys CDs, but I also buy records and also have a streaming yeah. subscription. So it's yeah. not any, but I realize that I'm a dying breed yeah. in that regard. But. Um, on that uh, kind of like on that same note, well, one of the advantages to streaming, and one of the reasons that you know revenues have been going up, is because of the access to back catalog uh, that streaming provides, and that's also another major advantage that the major labels hold is they have these mm -hmm. vast. Know, vast, vast, vast back catalogs that are now making more revenue than they did in the old sales paradigm because of playlists and just the accessibility of these back catalogs and streaming. Yep receiving any of that benefit or is it still that catalog the resurgence of the catalog um, um, I, it, it just so. depends on the artist yeah if it's an artist that is like we don't have Michael Jackson records or whatever right yeah. so if the artist is still active yeah. and growing then that will generate interest in the back catalog what else is this artist you know, and it's yeah. very easy for the for fans to access that, yeah. and where there would never be an opportunity for me to put a record in the store mm -hmm. in some remote city yeah. um, of the. So, it's uh, ac absolutely open things up, mm -hmm. but at our level, the, the numbers are so small that it's yeah. it's it's uh, negligible at this point. Yeah. But but maybe that'll change um, as guess, our as our artists grow in yeah. popularity. And like we've mentioned, you guys are very involved on the artist management side too. Um, those two heads of the company, management and label services, uh, essentially, how do they impact each other with an artist's career? Is there a noticeable difference in strategy when working with an artist that you also manage versus one that you don't? Yeah, generally speaking, I mean, we don't uh, we don't manage all the artists on our label, yeah. and um, we don't we are not the label necessarily for all the manage for all okay. the artists on our management company. Um, although it tends to be a fairly close relationship, but we might have a, we, in the past we might have been, had an artist that was signed to a major label, for example. Yeah. Um, so I find the most fulfilling and satisfying relationships are when we are the manager and the label, mm -hmm. and that um, because I always will wear my management hat first. Mm -hmm. um, I'll probably. Um, give the best deal I possibly can yeah. to uh, my management clients, uh, most open deal, and um, be all prepared to spend uh, marketing dollars. And that's really worked with Tanya Tagak, for example, like mm -hmm. uh, throat singing record. Mm -hmm. doesn't, doesn't scream commercial. Uh, right. So, yeah. Um, but we manage Tanya, yeah. so uh, the work that we've done as a label has really Amplified the amount of money she's able to command mm -hmm. as a live performer, yeah. and she's a very captivating live she performer is. for sure. So I look at that investment and it's like, okay, well, if I was just the label in her on her team, mm -hmm. I wouldn't spend any money on marketing. Yeah, I would be. I wouldn't make any money. I would. Mm -hmm. I would lose. I do. I lose money on the records. Yeah. They're expensive to make, yeah. and they're really expensive to market, make videos, and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, if I can. Um, absorb the absorb that loss yeah. because on the management side, 
Mm -hmm. So that's how, that, that's how that works, yeah. Interesting. And uh, to, uh, to wrap it up here, maybe I uh, may as well leave it on a note of advice for young emerging indie artists, since that's kind of who the audience is around okay. here at CMW. <laughs> but based on your experience, what's the, I guess, single most important change in strategy over the last, let's say, five years or so? Yeah, okay, that's, that's a good uh, question. That uh, indie label, or indie, indie artists, or maybe even other just newly uh, created indie labels should be keeping well, in mind. Well, I mean, it's massively different mm -hmm. in the last couple of yeah. years than it has been, and that's because it's uh, it's essential that you release um, simultaneously around the world. Yeah. So all the whole you world is now on a Friday. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's that used to be Monday over here and Tuesday. Yeah. You know, ev different everywhere. Um, so it's uh, important that uh, the label has the rights for uh, international. Uh, exploitation yeah. because um, a playlist that is housed in the Netherlands might yield great benefit over in America. Yeah. Like it's just all so connected. Yeah. Um, but setting up a global release strategy takes a lot of time and a lot of work, a lot of manpower. So we have a bigger team than we've ever had, and we're releasing fewer records than we ever have because. It takes a really long time to build the relationships of, you know, different people that we're going to hire in different markets, and set up tours, and mm -hmm. you know, all of those things. So um, that that has changed because it used to be more, okay, we'll go, we'll release the record in Canada, and we'll shop it around the world. Mm -hmm. We're not doing that anymore. Yeah. So um, it takes a lot more resources and a lot more time. Cool, Shauna, it was a real pleasure. Thank <laughs> you for doing this. Thank Cheers. you.